Today is all about most. Alex and I go through the most loss we felt in our fitness journey, the most we've learned about ourselves in a year, and the most disliked data train. Don't forget to subscribe or you'll make Alex cry. We'll catch you on the inside. How does it feel to now have a finished half sleeve? Feels pretty awesome. Um, I, this is a tattoo sleeve that I have thought about and worked on for ever. It seems like <laughs> literally just started with this first tattoo being a tattoo to commemorate my grandparents. And then the whole sleeve just kind of turned into this commemoration of my grandparents. So the last one is this little hot rod. I don't know if you guys can see that. Maybe I'll have a better picture. <laughs> have David put it actually on the screen. Um, but the hot rod is something that I would ride around in their house and my grandfather built it. And so, um, it's, it means a lot to me and I thought Keen did an amazing job on it. Um, yes, I agree. It looks awesome and sick. Did you get that first one in 2019? Yeah. Okay. I was trying to remember cause I started in 2020. Yeah, I got mine. it. I got the first tattoo in 2019 and then the rhino and the skull, I guess in 2022. Huh? 2020? It was 22? Yeah. Okay. Well, 2022. And then I just got obviously the back Yeah, because I was looking and mine was 20, 2022, 20, and 2024. Oh. And I thought it was interesting. And then we started on my leg, which I can't really show you guys. Yeah. Whip it up here. <laughs> Come on. Maybe Come David on will put another picture on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, goodness. What about your tattoos? I am super thrilled. The reason I have long sleeves on and not showing off right now, I know a lot of you guys are listening on the audio, is because I still have like that second skin on. And so I am letting that finish up, let it finish marinating. And then, you know, I'll rip it. How long, how long have you had the Saniderm, the second skin on? Uh, it's been seven days today. Wow, look at yes, you. Yes, I know. And it's like really not even wonky. Oh, mine is so itchy. Well, it's itchy, it's but like itchy. I could probably stay on another week. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, I am I am so excited to rip mine off because I've had mine on since Friday. Yeah. So, I don't even know if I can call it Friday, really Saturday because yeah. we were there till midnight basically. Mm -hmm. So I guess I've had it on for four days. Mm -hmm. and he said the earliest I can take it off is five days. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. How bad did it hurt? This, the elbow was terrible. Like right on the inside of my elbow was miserable. I was nauseous. I, I think that my body was just not prepared for tattoos after not getting tattooed for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And the first hour or so was okay. And then it went very downhill very quickly. Mm -hmm. And my body was screaming from the get-go. And I was nauseous. I had a headache. And we pushed through. We didn't get all the way done. There's more shading, but we got to a point where it's like, I'm happy with this right now. And the next time I'm here, we'll finish up these little fine details. Um, that first day was terrible. My leg was way more manageable. Well, I am very excited that we got that done. But today we're going to dive into a lot of mosts. Most. Most. Okay. <laughs> so we are going to just go ahead and start off. We'll right. dive what's, into it. What's the first one? So what is the most lost you felt in your fitness journey? The most lost I have felt in my fitness journey was probably right after I decided I was going to go all in with coaching and stop competing myself. And that was very challenging for me to kind of figure out what my purpose in the gym was going to be. Because as I was getting started in the gym, I started when I was in middle school and that was for athletics. And so I was doing athletic-based work all through the beginning. And that was the purpose for me being in the gym was to get better at the sport. And then as soon as I was done with sport in college, I immediately transitioned into bodybuilding. And so it was like, I'm, I am training to improve my physique. I am training to be better at this sport now. And then as I made the transition to being solely focused on coaching for myself, that was the first time that I was like, I am training for my enjoyment because I have a passion for the gym, but I don't have this specific thing that I'm working towards at this time. And I was working very, very long days and I was not prioritizing my time in the gym. I was just prioritizing client work and all those things. And so that was probably the most loss that I had felt, the most loss that I had felt in my body composition and how my body looked. And that was a, a challenging window, but something I needed to go through to better understand what training really meant to me. Do you feel like 
if you could go back that you would do it a different way or what would you tell yourself in those situations um, if you could now? If, if I could go back and tell myself something different is that I could still focus on client work and not just make myself suffer with maximal amount of check-ins every day to work with as many people as humanly possible. Um, I would have a cap to the amount of individuals I was working with and not force myself to be at my desk 10, 11 hour days, um, just doing check-ins. So I would change that. Mm -hmm. And then I would also probably keep a coach in place. Cause that was also the other challenge is that when I decided to discontinue competing, I also decided that I was not going to be working with a coach. So I went into this time where I needed the accountability, possibly the most ever without it. And then continued to work more and more and put the priority of me training at lower and lower on my priority list because I let other, other things and other people um, take that priority. Do you think that you would listen to yourself if you told yourself that? No, I, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm very hard-headed now. Interesting. I was more hard-headed then. <laughs> I didn't know that about you at all. <laughs> I'm learning new things every day about Isn't you, Isn't that honey. crazy? Uh, with that, you had talked about that time that you needed a coach and really being able to still care about your fitness goals. So what do you feel like that looks like if you could talk to a, like a coach that's possibly listening to this of how beneficial it is to either have your own coach or just still be able to focus on your own goals while helping other people? Sure. With coaching, you are spending your entire day creating training and nutrition, cardio, supplementation, all those things for other people, as well as troubleshooting all the things that they have going on. And so to leave yourself, and this is often the, the coach's thought process because they're going to put their clients before themselves. And this, I mean, you are in a job that is to help people and you are probably passionate about helping people, which is going to put them first and put yourself self second. And so if you're going through the entire day doing all these things for other people, it it's going to be tough to do those things for yourself, creating your own training, creating nutritional protocols and staying on top of those things. Not saying that it's impossible, but it certainly is more challenging. And it is such a relief to take those things off of your plate and have those things delivered to you from someone that you trust that you're working with um, to put those things in action. And so it is much better peace of mind as well as gives you so much more confidence in the time that you're working with your clients because you're walking the walk. You are doing exactly what you're encouraging them to do and keeping up with your training and tracking your food and staying on top of all these different variables that you're asking them each week to do the same. And so you are able to come with much greater conviction and confidence to each of their check-ins as well as being in a healthier position for yourself. Your mental health, your physical health, your energy is going to be better, all these different variables. And so um, to the coach, that feels like because I'm a coach, I shouldn't have a coach. It's like <laughs> you are missing the boat here. <laughs> like you are needing to constantly learn through this process. That's going to be one thing is that when you're coaching, you are never going to have all of the answers. And so being able to work with someone that you admire, someone that um, is going to be able to share new things with you and challenge you in different ways is tremendously helpful to your coaching because your coaching is always going to be evolving and improving in some areas, changing in some areas. You're going to have different perspectives provided to you. So then maybe you are able to see it a different way to change the way that you're coaching coaching. And um, I found that to be tremendously helpful because each of the coaches that I've worked with, I've been able to take little things from that coaching experience. Most of it being, hey, I like how this person does this. I'm going to work this into how I coach as well. I like how this person communicates. I want to work this in as well. And there are some things where it's like, I do not like this <laughs> and I'm not going to take away from this. This is good for me to see an experience from a client perspective because I do not want to coach this way at all. And so it really really is, it is so beneficial because it's helping you and your health, but it's also helping your coaching as well. A hundred percent. And I think that it just, like you said, allows you to feel so much better because you're keeping promises that you made to yourself instead of just running yourself into the ground. And it's a very odd juxtaposition, but I know so many fitness coaches that do run themselves into the ground and don't show up for their health. And it's not that I look at them and I think, oh, you're such a hypocrite. It's more that I look at them and I think, 
oh my gosh, things can be so much better for you if you just realize that taking care of yourself is going to help your business and help your clients even more so because of that foundation. Absolutely. What is the most loss that you have felt in your fitness journey? I would say for sure it was around 2018. Uh, It was a time where I was having some hormonal imbalances and it felt like I was checking every box and my body was responding completely opposite of the way that it had been responding properly for so long. And I went to so many doctor's appointments and was just kind of written off. At one point was given like a list of like five laxatives to buy and to use them all. And I was having a lot of pain. I was having a lot of cysts. And it was just a time where I didn't know if I was ever going to get my body back where it felt like I had worked so hard to like I'd already been multiple years into my fitness journey and I had put so much effort into it. And then it just felt like it completely was out of my control. My acne got really bad again. And I just felt very hopeless because I was doing all the right things, so to speak, but my hormones were not in the right place. And so that was a time where I just remember I would like take my check-in pictures and just cry. And I hadn't necessarily had that before in regards to taking check-in photos. If I had, of course, taken ones that I wasn't like the most happy with, or even when I first started my fitness journey of taking photos and being like, I'm not in love with these, or obviously I'm starting this because I want to change how I look. But it was never a time where it just felt like I had been doing so much right and wasn't seeing the results for it. Uh, So it was also a really hard time because it was I had moved. We had moved in together. It was right after we got married. We were navigating uh, the first year of marriage as well as being away from both of our families. Uh, The gym that we were working out with, I felt like a lot of anxiety going to. It wasn't a great gym environment. And so it was a time that I really struggled. uh, And you were obviously very supportive through that time and being able to help me alongside my coach at that time of getting everything back in line where it needed to be. And and now my body is responding how it should be. Uh, But that was definitely the most lost that I felt because before I definitely felt lost, especially when starting. But it was an aspect of like, you feel lost and you don't know what to do because you're not doing the right things. But this was a time where I was doing the right things and I knew what to do and I still wasn't getting where I wanted to go. And that was super defeating to go through. How long of a process was that? Like a year process to get everything back in line. Um, Probably started to see better results within six months. But uh, with anything hormonal, I always try to kind of give a heads up to clients of this can be a long path to get back to where things need to go. And it can be a defeating path to go on. So you would need to set your expectations clearly of I'm working on healing my body right now. And it's not about having this huge transformation. And that's really what I kept my head down on. Just continue to do the work, continue to do what is told of you and recognize that the goal right now is to heal your body instead of change your body. And that was a again, difficult to go through because all I wanted was change at that time. I didn't feel comfortable or confident in my body. And that felt like something that I had finally gained in myself to have it pulled away again. Was there a lot of ebbs and flows? Did you feel like you were making progress then it'd go back down? And did you feel like it was like that? Or did you feel like it was kind of consistent and gradual to the end of that year? I feel like it was pretty gradual, not saying that it was linear, but it was very gradual of the direction that it was going. And I did have a pretty intense protocol put in place that was like very specific foods. It was was very specific. Yeah, Yeah. very specific foods, very specific supplements. It had to be on top of a lot of stuff that, again, I hadn't had to have been in the past. So I felt like it was, at least by memory, I could be incorrect on that. But I feel like it was pretty gradual of getting to the spot where I just felt better and better as I went, although that's not always the case with hormonal stuff. Yeah. I, I wish I had the knowledge that I do now to, yeah. <laughs> in that scenario. We could have gone about it in a much better way, but yeah. it, we only knew what we knew at the time. And um, 
yeah, could have been different. Could have been different, but you know, it worked out for Didn't. the best. You know, learned learned a lot about myself, learned a lot about my body, and was able to have a lot of patience and grace with myself. Um, anger, of course, too, but <laughs> <laughs> the patience was laced in there. <laughs> According to a recent survey, 71% of women said they want to increase their glute size. And I get it because I was a part of that 71% until I got my hands on the PD Glute Program. It is a 16-week program, but we have the first four weeks available for free. And just in case you don't believe us, you don't have to just take my word for it. Take Nicole's word, who said, this 12-week program is unreal. I'm a trainer myself, but holy shit. This glute program is mind blown emoji. I have never felt my glutes engage this much. Or take Kinsey's word for it, who said, the workout has been challenging but straightforward, which is great. I have always loved training legs, but never had a clear plan. So this has been very beneficial. I've seen a noticeable difference in my glutes and legs. It's kind of crazy how well it's been working. So head to the show notes below to access the first four weeks of the PD glute program for free and get results like Nicole, Kenzie, and the thousands of others who have said the same. What is the most food you've eaten during a growth phase? <laughs> I believe that this is 3,800 calories on a day-to-day -day basis. There's certainly days where we had gone into the 4,000s, but I don't think that I was ever consistently for like weeks or months eating above 4,000 calories. The highest that it was set at was 3,800 calories for... I, if my memory is correct, I think it was three months that we stayed there and managing my digestion and managing the frequency of eating all that food, mm -hmm. not fun. I think going into it, I was ecstatic. I was like, oh my gosh, I can eat so much food. I can eat so much cereal. I can do all these different things, but it's a, it's a part-time gig. Oh, it freaking is. And, and preparing it is a full-time gig. And then you've got a part-time gig just eating it. Yeah. Um, it's a, you know, that is a, a journey. I, I commend all like real heavyweight bodybuilders who are having to do that every single day. And then they're in their improvement season eating well over, you know, 3,500, 4,000 calories, whatever the case may be. Kudos to those guys, because that is a grind mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And I know it sounds simple of like, just eat food, <laughs> but it is not that simple. Yeah. Um, it, food does not seem appetizing. You're not eating to appetize yourself. You're eating for a specific goal in mind and, and putting on a abnormal amount of muscle tissue that is not necessary for anyone to put on. That's the goal. And so um, that being the scenario, you know, those guys get all the praise from me, but that would be the highest that my food was ever taken for an extended period of time. Was that in like a 2017 time frame? I think a little bit later than okay. that. Maybe, I don't know. It'd be 27 or 17 or 18. Because I was thinking about when you're at your old apartment and it would literally be, you would have like a family size box of cereal every day and you would have those muffins to try to move mm -hmm. your calories up. And it was, it was, you would be like sweating at the end of your meals and so uncomfortable and just trying to get more food down. And then it would be like an hour or two later and you're like, gotta eat again. I don't want to, but gotta make it happen. Yeah. I mean, going back to the surplus episode, <laughs> I could have had a much better plan in place yeah. of structure to those meals rather than trying to. And I was such a nerd when it came to peri workout nutrition at that time. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, what is it? Um, eight years later, not that long. Mm -hmm. Math, seven. Um, with that time frame, I like at that time, all I wanted to do was get as much protein and carbohydrates around my training as humanly possible. Because especially during that window, research was really supporting like this needs to be biased. And now at this time, when you're in a surplus, the peri-workout nutrition is not as prioritized. When we're in a deficit and really close to a, a competition per se, now that peri-workout nutrition is extremely important. But in a surplus, not near as important. But I was making it a huge deal. I was having, I think, 40 or 50% of my carbs pre-workout. Which and then so many, <laughs> so many, and then 40%, I think post-workout. And then I was having, I think five or 10% intra. And that was terrible. Yeah. And then I also was doing, I, we're not doing essential amino acids during these workouts. I'm doing a full scoop of whey protein <laughs> in, in <laughs> the Intra shake. Intra workout. Intra workout. I haven't even digested my pre-workout meal yet. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I need another shake. I need more protein. <laughs> more I need more protein. carbs. And 
I need to get home as fast as humanly possible after the session to get my post workout meal in. I mean, I was neurotic. Yes. And so I can confirm. People are gonna be like, let's leave the gym now. I'm done with my workout. I gotta get home. Got to go. Do not wait, make me wait any longer. Um, so I was insane at that time. And (laughs) I was eating a ton of food. I think that the most I had was around 3,000 calories. It was somewhere between like a three to 400 carb. And then the most my protein has gotten to has been 180, um, which that was a little bit of a push. Right now it's around 150, 160, which is a little bit better for me personally. Um, And I think I had like 70 or 80 grams of fat, but that was around the same time as maybe like a year or so, give or take around where you were really pushing into it because a lot of what was going on in the fitness space was like, you need to bulk, like straight up bulk, put on fat, put on muscle. That is the only way to do it versus like we talked about in the surplus episode of some different ways you can do it. And I, it was really just about how high could macros get. Um, And so it was a time where I also just felt like I was shoving food down my throat constantly and was not that fun after all. It's fun for like a week or two. And then after that, it's like, oh my gosh, I have to keep eating. The the highest that my food was, was probably in high school when yeah. I was eating like 4,500 <laughs> to a 5,000 calories. Oh my gosh. But I will say that I never, ever finished my food. Yeah. That was the kicker is like, I would, we would structure out those meals and I would get 75 or 80% done with the meal. I'm going to throw up. I can't eat anymore. And then I'd leave that and then I'd go to the next meal and so on and so forth. So I never really finished those meals. So I, I wouldn't put that in that category. Um, but that was also the era of a uh, half gallon of chocolate milk, a pint of cottage cheese with two packets of tuna to finish the evening. And some relish. Yeah, that was the era. And I do not miss that cool. at all. Still makes me a little queasy to see cottage cheese now. It makes me very queasy to hear you talk about it. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most you've learned about yourself in a year? Oh, my gosh. We're talking at a great time. This last <laughs> year, I learned a lot about myself. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself? What did I learn about myself? That I am far more resilient than I ever thought I was. Um, that I am much more capable than I ever thought that I was. I think that this past year was a time frame where I put myself out there more than I ever have and was more myself in front of the camera and in front of others. Um, I felt more comfortable around family members and friends and just being myself and not so anxious of what other people think or, or how I'm being perceived or am I going to get like, how does this person want to have this thing be answered. Like I wasn't overly concerned with those small details. And it was just a year where I really had to get outside of my comfort zone. And that allowed me to learn a lot about myself. But I do think that I, every year I walk away feeling like it was the year prior was the year that I learned the most. So it could be a little bit of recency bias. But this last year is a little bit of a different example. I can say with quite a bit of confidence that that is truly the case. Um, for what I've learned about me. What do you feel like was the most transformative thing to learn about yourself that you're carrying into 2024? Transformative is that we took physique development and flipped it on its head. You know, we yeah, we did a complete least. overhaul from the beginning of 2023 to the end of 2023. Um, and that was something I was so scared of and was very emotional about, didn't know how it was going to go, but I trusted in you and I, and I trusted in Miguel and I trusted in the people that were here and willing to, um, figure it out with us. And that was a, a, a very scary and transformative process, but that allowed for me to have a confidence in myself that I was lacking up until that point, because I was using different things to kind of, um, as a safety net. And by flipping everything on its head and, and taking the direction that we did, there was no safety net. Mm-hmm. It was, it, everything lived and died by us and that's how it was going to be. And we were willing to do that. And that was the best possible thing for me at that time. Was there anything when it came to self-care or something within your routine that really changed in the past year that helped you? I got better with the all or nothing mentality, which is (laughs) always a progression for me of just figuring out how it's okay to have tidbits of things and being able to take what you can for that particular day and then build on that. It doesn't have to be this perfect thing or nothing. It can truly be like, I got 
I've had like this last year, I probably had more 20 minute workouts of just getting what I could done in 20 minutes than I ever have in my life. Like you asked me two or three years ago, Hey, you have 20 minutes to work out. I'd be like, I can't get a, I can't get a full workout and I'm not going to work out. Mm -hmm. I'll wait until I have the perfect amount of time to get a full session in and be 100% by the book because that's how I did things. And now I'm in a much better position of just you know, taking what I have and, and being able to make the most out of it. I would agree with that. I I very much so have seen that change in you of just being able to know your limits better and not in a way of you being soft, but just being aware of I can't push myself into the ground every single time. I need to stop short of that. Yes, I've, I have figured out that life has boundaries and um, I need to be able to stay within them to allow myself to be much happier and much more calm and all those things. Crazy. <laughs> it's a crazy concept. <laughs> crazy concept. Yes. Uh, I would say I agree with you in the aspect of like each year I feel like, okay, I've learned so much. And I think a part of that is just you are stacking so much that you're learning of if you learn so much about yourself and then you take that into the next year, that's going to help you learn even more about yourself. So I would say that one of the like the most transformative years for me was probably when I started my fitness journey because it was something Something that I finally realized that I was capable and could accomplish things that I had previously told myself that I couldn't. And that was a huge, huge year for me to just not care what other people thought, do what I wanted to do, and finally go for a goal that I felt was not doable. Like, I never thought that my body would look the way that it does now or look the way that it did a year into my fitness journey. I thought that I was just stuck looking that way and that everyone around me could be petite and small and I just couldn't be the way that I wanted to look. And so I would say that was probably one of the most transformative years. But I think that this past year is definitely the year I've learned the most about myself and really diving into and having really good conversation with myself, having really Really great conversation with you and honestly having no other option but to like figure out what was going on in between my head because it was a year that had obviously a lot of sad fucking things happening but it was a year that even though we had a lot of support from people it felt very lonely and it was something where I had to be okay with being alone and be okay with working through it myself. And that's something I'm so thankful for because in the past, I would have really turned away from that and tried to um, distract myself with something, try to just pour myself into something else or try to sweep it under the rug. But there was no option but to face it all head on and to really figure out what's going on, what do I want for myself, how do I want to mentally handle this, because this is going to determine a lot of other things that go on in my life. And it was just a year that I finally felt like a leader and could step into that role and feel like I could do that. So I just feel like each year I've learned I'm so capable. And then this past year was all about that belief and that self-belief of no matter what, even if I did not have an answer for how things were going to go, I repeated to myself so many times, like, Alex and I will find a way. Yeah. Like, we will figure it out. There's going to be no other answer except to figure it out. And that was my mentality. And that I felt like, allowed me to learn about myself so much because I just always believed in myself and in us to make it happen. Even if still to this day, there's some things I don't know how they're going to happen, but it's like, I believe that if we just keep going, we'll make it happen. Absolutely. And I will say that you have become an incredible leader. Okay. You have created an incredible staff that is so closely knit and so in alignment with our culture and what we want to have as a team. Um, it's really special. And I know how scary the last year was for you to jump into that leadership role because it was a massive change for you to step outside of just coaching. Um, well, you were never just coaching. Don't let me, <laughs> <laughs> I know don't what let you, me lie I to you guys. I know what you mean. I know what you, yeah. And so you went from coaching as heavily as you were to now in this leadership role and taking on more meetings than you had ever <laughs> taken on in your life and oh, still continue to do so. lots of meetings that happen. Um, um. And just being such a strong leader and, and really 
leading by example. It's a really special thing to watch. So I'm very proud of you. Well, I appreciate it. I love you. <laughs> we're a little too far away, but no, we're just we're always close enough. <laughs> What is the most impactful aspect of your fitness journey? Most impactful aspect of my fitness journey. Gosh, so many things. Because within my fitness journey, it has given me so much. It has provided me a passion. It has provided me a job. It has provided me an opportunity to provide others with a job. It has provided me the opportunity to meet my wife. It's like <laughs> you you give me fitness and I'm able to showcase all the good things in my life. And so to say that there's one specific impactful thing would would be untrue. It, yeah. It's it's all conclusively along the journey. I have been able to have fitness as this cornerstone that has been the starting point of so many good things in my life. And um, I'm just forever grateful and, and know that it's going to be a part of my life in different capacities. It's going to change over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, and, and will continue to evolve and look differently, but it's always going to be a part of my life and something I'm always grateful for, something that I look forward to. Sometimes I don't look so forward <laughs> to, but I would say in the grander scheme, I look forward to the opportunity to improve myself and challenge myself. And I think that one thing that has had the most impact outside of all the things it's brought is just the the challenge to my mind and the disciplinary component of just show up every day and get to your goal. It's a longer process. It's it's the daily commitment that's going to get you to where you need to be or want to be. And that has been probably the, the one of the greatest things that I've learned from it. And it is always there for me as well. I've gone to training after you know, really stressful, really sad days. I've I've cried during training. I've laughed during training. I've screamed during training. Every emotion has come out of me during a training session. And it's always been there for me in some of my darkest moments and something that I can rely on to pull me out of a, a crappy headspace to have a little bit of a shining point in a bad day. And so everything. <laughs> well, that's kind of my answer too, <laughs> sadly. But I will try to narrow it down and just say that it, it's shown me that the only thing I'm entitled to is the work itself. Yeah. And that has been something so powerful, like you've mentioned, and just propelling me in so many other aspects of my life of I'm not entitled to having a fantastic physique or having a certain amount of results. I'm only entitled to the work. And that is something that has allowed me to show up day after day within my fitness journey, but then in so many other aspects of my life where I feel like before I started my fitness journey, that was the main pain point in my life as I didn't fully commit and go all in. I was either too anxious, too nervous, too in my head, didn't believe in myself, didn't know how capable I was, whatever it was, I, I wasn't confident. I didn't feel good in my body. And it's really hard to do good in other aspects of your life when you don't feel good. And that's the other thing is it brought my health and all aspects of health. And that's something that I'm very glad that we talk about so many different aspects of health. And it's not just about, hey, here's how you get ripped. Where, yeah, we'll we'll teach you how to get ripped, but we're also going to teach you how to do it in a sustainable way where you can have your health because your health is your wealth. It just is. And I have gained so much through gaining my health. And each and every time I think about, oh, I don't want to go for this walk, or I don't want to train, or I don't want to eat this food, or whatever it may be, I'm brought back to how do I feel when I do these things? And the answer is, I always feel better. It always makes me feel better. It always makes me a better person. And that's something that I will always cling to, however fitness looks as my life continues to evolve, because it's evolved since I've started, but it's still an extremely important aspect of my day to day. Absolutely. I love that. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. 
And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Uh, What is the most difficult thing for you to stick to in your recovery? So like stretching, water intake, sleep. What does that look like for you? Um, When are you asking me? (laughs) (laughs) I feel like this is a no-brainer for you. Really? Okay, what is the answer? Sleep. Well, I think that sleep is challenging not because of training, though. Yeah. Like, sleep is challenging to me because I am neurotic with my work. Yeah, but it's saying what is the difficult thing for you to stick to in your recovery? Okay, then, yeah, sleep, for sure. (laughs) And one thing I wish I was amazing with is sleep. I think that many individuals think that because I have a lot of answers when it comes to sleep, you know, asking questions, supplementation, all these different things is because I'm like great with it. It's like, no, I have the answers because I have sucked at it for a while now. And I came from a place of like, I can sleep at any time. Like when we first met, I could fall asleep easy peasy, no issues whatsoever. And then over the last three years. Uh, Well, it's 2024 now, then I would say 2020, I feel, is like when a lot of it started. 2020 was, yeah. 2020 was probably the the worst of it. And I would say that it originated with my inability to have stress mitigation any way outside of resistance training. Yes. My only way of working through stress and giving myself some relief from um, anything, like I had no way of expressing my emotions. My only way of, of expressing my emotions was to train as hard as I could. And when that was ripped away from me with everything going on in 2020, that was a really hard wake up call. And that's when all the sleep issues kind of presented themselves because I would just glue myself to my computer, work all day, take far too much caffeine throughout the day, and then be like, I am still, my brain is shot. I can't even like create a sentence, but I, my body is still so awake type situation has so much energy to provide. And so, um, over that time frame, I've had ebbs and flows to really good seasons of sleep. And then I've had really poor seasons of sleep and, uh, navigating through that has always been really a challenge for me over that time frame. Yeah. I would say not only the the gyms being taken away in that time frame, but it was something where we didn't know how long it was going to last or what that meant for our job because exactly. it is something where having a fitness coach is more considered a luxury service, even though I think it's very necessary for some people. It's not of, hey, when people aren't working, that's where I want to spend money. And so it was a time where we had to scramble a lot to be like, we're not letting this freaking sink. We are well, going I mean, all we in. We literally shot a brand new exercise library <laughs> with all bands, <laughs> 70 plus videos in like 48 hours. Yeah. We were like, we're getting it all out to every client ASAP. Yeah. And we created all of those at-home training programs in a less than a week. And we created all those handbooks on like how to deal with like your mental health, how to navigate through stuff with your family, with everything going on in the world. We did like all of that within I just mean, a few days. I mean, it was literally, we did a complete overhaul. I didn't, we didn't use anybody else's videos. We took, <laughs> oh, we, we shot all fresh new videos, <laughs> typical us. Yeah. Um, off, <laughs> they were iPhone videos, not Miguel great videos. <laughs> they were, I, I passed one of those the other day. We were doing like a reverse hyper on the corner, on the edge of, of, the, couch. of the couch. Yeah. And the video is like, it's cut off my head. You only see like my shoulders and then you just see my legs like flailing off of this couch. We even have videos on how to work out with towels. That's like true. Like how to do those lateral raises with <laughs> towels and everything. But like we at that time were literally, we were waking up at 5 a.m. You would go and get us coffee of like nitro cold brews and at, or you'd get red eye. So it'd literally be a coffee with espresso in it. Then we would drink that. Sometimes you would get a second coffee I don't throughout like the day. bragging about this. I'm not bragging. It's embarrassing. It is. And then we would literally work until 
until be at our computers from 5 a.m. till 10 or 11, then cut off work at 10 or 11 p.m. Then we're so wired. We have not wound down, had any time for ourselves. And so then we would procrastinate our bedtime and stay up until 1 or 2 a.m. trying to hang out with each other and spend time together and then wake up at 5 a.m. and do it again. Yeah, that's how we And so things. that was like almost all of 2020 because we were determined that we will not fail. Yeah. <laughs> Which and, we didn't. So go us. Well, then that's how you see my sleep issues started. <laughs> <laughs> but they have improved a lot. They have improved and a lot. The biggest times I feel like it flares up is just when you do kind of get out of alignment of recognizing what are the things that do really push you towards having 100%. the best sleep. It, it only happens now when I'm behind on work and I'm like neglecting all the things that I know I need to do. Like if I get up, like today is a perfect example. I get up and I go and get steps in. I do some simple yoga and do some simple stretching and, um, have that, get my water in, and then I'm able to to train and, and do all the physical things and get my steps in. All, like the things I know are going to make my day better. I do those things. My sleep's totally fine. I don't have like this sleep problem. I have a problem with putting myself behind my work. And then I need to just continuously do a better job of that um, because my work is always better when i when I make a priority of doing all the things within my health and um, all the movement and those different things, that's when my work is the best. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy concept. It's really weird. When I work in a more balanced approach and taking care of all the the boxes, my work is 10x better instead of when I'm just like work only. I just sit here at my desk all day and I'm I'm pissed and I just want to blah, 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 <laughs> you know? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I would say that for me, it's probably the stretching. Like I feel really good with like water intake, sleep most of the time and with steps and stuff like that. But the stretching is something I very much so skimp on, which is why I like having yoga in my routine because then it's like, then that's my stretching. I don't have to stretch outside of that. And I know myself well enough to know that, but because life has kind of been a little bit wonky, then I haven't been as regular with yoga. So this is my reminder to get back regular with yoga. Well, I'm telling you, you can join me for the morning routine. Once, once I'm able to sweat after the tattoos, you go, you go downstairs. I don't like doing yoga at home. It's not a, a long. It's t 15 minutes. I understand that. It's literally 15 minutes. You, the sauna is already brewing. The sauna is brewing. You've got the, you do the yoga. You do 20 minutes on the treadmill. Now you're gonna, you know, one of us is gonna. We maybe we can walk on it together. <laughs> Yeah. I'll take half of it. You take half of okay. it. Okay. How maybe, about you go on that Peloton you got? <laughs> maybe I do the Peloton. <laughs> and then then sauna right after, oh, go upstairs, gosh. shower, and then you get right on with your day. It's amazing. Oh, goodness. It's the setup. That's not my setup personally, but. It is mine. Um, what is the most liked and or disliked day of the week for training for you? Okay. Most liked, you can probably go to our YouTube channel and see that my most liked is chest. <laughs> <laughs> because that is easily the most train with me episodes we've ever done. Um, is it really? I would have said legs are back. Really? I don't know. I, maybe not. I, who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> said it so confidently. I thought I was wrong. <laughs> I said it so matter of fact, like so many people on social. Anyway, um, my least favorite is probably legs. And it's not because I don't enjoy training legs. It's because my- You're a maniac regulation system when training <laughs> legs is terrible. And it's non-existent. I'm much better with gauging RPE and RIR when it comes to uh, back sessions, chest sessions, arms, delts, whatever. But as soon as we say it's leg day, like I'm good with puking. I'm good with <laughs> literally seeing stars and like I'm ready to go. Yeah, himself. I'm ready to go balls to the wall. I that's what I enjoy. I know. But then I get super anxious and fearful of it before because it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> or he goes in and he does it and then he's absolutely I'm worthless the worthless rest of the day afterwards yeah and maybe for a day after that too <laughs> <laughs> so I, I my gauge of of training legs with a moderate intensity is not great and that's why it's my least favorite no this one was hard for me because I feel like I would have very easily in the past answered legs because I just always preferred training upper body but 
I just, they're different. So you're like, saying Lay's is your least favorite? In the past, it 100% was. Whereas now, I feel like it is and it isn't. Like, I look forward to training legs, but at the same time, I also fear training legs. But I always love a good upper body day. I love the feeling of fearing your training session. I love being scared right before a training session. It's good and bad because the bad part is, is when you are like getting ready for it and you like psych yourself, not psych yourself up, but you like get anxious yeah, you get and then anxious. you're like, I have to really perform and like go after it. I when love you that. Know. I, I love it and I hate it. Like there's some times where I'm just like, I don't have that in me today where like recently I've just been doing like 20, 30 minute sessions, what you can get in. So then when it goes back to like, you're going in there and you're training with the specific intensity or our RPE, I'm like, frick, I am going in there and training I because love it. I've learned intensity from Mr. Redline himself. Yeah. And so then all I know is, all right, we're going balls to the wall. I so badly wish that I could train with Miguel on a regular basis so that <laughs> I like, cause then I would have that anxiety, but then you also have the opportunity to train with someone. So then it ups it just a little <laughs> bit more, but no way within our schedule has that ever worked. Well, that's why I like <laughs> when you and I train together, but you don't do that with me anymore. You want to train? Yeah. Okay. Together. Yep. You want to run the glute program with me? No, I do not want to. Why? I wrote it. I know how bad it is. Not bad, hard. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. What is your most liked and or disliked time to train? Oh, um, I think this changes constantly for me. My favorite is one o'clock. Yeah, like an 11 or a one. Mm. Yeah, if you have, let's say you do breakfast at nine and early lunch at 11. No, no. breakfast at eight. Early lunch at 11, train at 1. Oh, talk about pumps. Talk about having all the energy on planet Earth to hit that 1 o'clock session. Or that 11 o'clock, you go 9 a.m. breakfast, also pre-workout meal. Get good hydration in, maybe 60, 75, what, 90 ounces. What? <laughs> Get some good water in. I mean, another great situation for an awesome workout. My least favorite eight o'clock at night. <laughs> Don't love that. You were just saying the other day, you're like, I love the spotlight. I love when it's all dark in here. I There are periods of time where I enjoy it, but I would say it cumulatively, my least favorite is eight o'clock at night. Yes. That used to be, that's how I started training was at that time mm. because it was like the time I had after classes. And I disliked that for sure. My favorite time is that 11 to 1 a.m. I love- 1 I'm not 1 a.m., 1 p.m. I love training when the sun is out. And oh, yeah. especially because like we train at home. So then it's coming through the window. And if it's warm enough, like even if it's cold, I'm happy if the sun is out and I can like just see it beaming through the window. But even more so if it's warm and we can put the garage door up and the sun's just, it is such a good feeling all in all. And that is the best time. I would rather train early in the morning then train late at night yeah. for sure. Personally. I'm with you on that. I mean, nothing beats a hot garage door open workout, 90 plus degrees yeah. outside. I mean, you're sweating as soon as you get out. It's so humid. I love that. Nothing beats that. I don't know about the humidity, but I'll take the heat. Even now you get real bent out of shape with how hot I keep the gym. I, I don't get bent out of shape. I just want to open a window for some airflow. Like I want no, it I wanna hot be, in there. I want to be choking. It's hot. Okay. But you can sweat. I can't. So then I have no escape and I'm just inflating from the inside. I'm just swelling and you're sweating it all out. And I'm just becoming the swollen freaking bowling ball. Okay. I understand. No, I understand. It doesn't seem like you understand. Okay. What is the most exciting part about growing a business? Most exciting part. Or the most terrifying. You choose. <laughs> <laughs> they probably could fit into the same category. Um, with our business specifically, we have such a cool opportunity to change people's lives, like really make a lasting impact on others' lives. And for them to be able to pass that on to their their children and to their family members and to their friends and all these different things, I love that opportunity. And so being able to just touch more lives, I think is a really exciting thing. I love the aspect of being able to provide opportunities for other individuals to work for physique development. I find that to be such a, a cool feeling and certainly a greater pressure, but I 
I really, really enjoy that. Um, I also really enjoy betting on myself mm -hmm. and putting myself at the forefront and saying, I do not know exactly how I'm going to get to this, but I have 100% faith in myself that I'm going to get there and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to find the resources to make that happen. And that's a big part of, of building a business. Like, I don't think I've known, the only thing that I've known since we've gotten going is how to coach <laughs> and like how to get people to where they need to be. You'd be surprised how many coaching businesses don't have that down. <laughs> yeah. But that's the only thing that I've I've known the entire time. And then everything else has been like, how can we figure this out? <laughs> Literally. And just listening to our intuition and being good humans and continuing to function in that way of like, I'm trying to do what I think is best to my core and taking care of everybody. And I hope this is the right decision. I hope everyone around me understands that if this is a mistake, it is not intentional and I am willing to do whatever it takes to fix it afterwards. And that's been the intention from the very beginning. And, um, building a business is a, a, a scary process for sure, but one that I feel very confident in having you as a partner I feel way more confident doing it with you because yeah. if I was doing this by myself, I think this would be a train wreck. I would have quit a while ago. You guys ago. probably wouldn't be seeing this podcast, honestly, <laughs> if I was doing this by myself. I'd just be glued behind my computer screen Literally. coaching and you guys probably would never hear of me and I'd be scrambling to even have clients because I would be doing no outreach or any content because I'd just be coaching. Yeah, I would say that one of the most exciting things is just well, doing it with you is extremely exciting and it just feels something that I'm I'm always so thankful and blessed for because I remember growing up, my parents are real estate agents and they had a home office and worked together. And I always thought that they were clinically insane. And I was like, I would need space for my future spouse. I go to my work, they go to their work. We come together at the end of the day. And I just never understood how they spent so much time together and were then would spend all their free time together too. And then I met you and... Uh, I can't imagine it any other way. Like even on the days and the weeks and the months that feels so long and it just feels like I am stuck behind my computer screen or I'm stuck in meetings all day or I there's extra stress because of the pressure of being a business owner and having to provide for other people. If you don't always get the same flexibility if people think you're your own boss, you get to do whatever you want. And it's like, yes, but no at the same time. And it's something where just being able to do it together and know that we are partners working in it and there's so much to be said about how much we're both pouring into it. That's something really exciting to me as well as something that is very like, um, I feel like it helps me personally of just being able to build again within that self-confidence of betting on yourself showing up. And so even though I don't know where everything is going to go and exactly how things are going to go, it's the aspect of like, it's exciting to bet on yourself mm -hmm. and to truly just say, it's on me to do this. I'm, I'm not going to leave it to someone else. I'm going to create the future that I want. I'm going to create the life that I want. And I'm going to do it with the people that I want along with me. And so it's been so exciting to grow the team, even though it's been very scary too. It's been so exciting to grow the team and just to be able to have the team members that we have in place. It is so fun to get on our team meetings and just to be able to connect with everyone. And it's just exciting to know what the possibilities are. Like that's so exciting if there's so many possibilities because the sky's the limit, as they say. Yeah. Very grateful just to build it with you though. Yeah. I think that's the the biggest thing. Do you have any most you want to ask to end out the episode? Most. Um when was the most that you loved me? <laughs> <laughs> Every second. I just love you more and more and more. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> what is the uh, food that you've eaten the most in your life? Um, from ages five until 20, probably my grandmother's fried chicken, <laughs> easily. I, I mean, take me back to college where I'd come home and my grandmother would send me back with chicken fried rice enough to last me an entire week as a, as a college kid. I mean, I was eating a lot of food. Um, she would send me with that. So that was all I ate most of the time. Um, now I would say 
probably your pancakes. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Sous Chef Cookbook coming. 2024. Let's go. <laughs> Finally. Two years, three years of promoting. Oh, I think it's more than that. Um, but <laughs> I would probably say the food that I've eaten the most over That's my whole- That's the end of the promo for the Sous Chef Cookbook. Let's keep it rolling. <laughs> Give them more information. All the best treats you've ever seen. Best <laughs> meals. All of my okay, favorite meals. Okay, this is where the issue started with is Alex promoting it before it was ready. So it's this coming 2020. 24, but we will give more details down the line. Listen, guys, you need to be excited. <laughs> Keep you do DMing need her. To be excited. Fill up the DMs and say, where is the cookbook? <laughs> oh my God. I need the cookbook. I've gotten all the treats. Oh, They're amazing. Goodness. Anyways, the food that <laughs> I have likely eaten the most over my entire life is popcorn. Easily. Easily. As far as like consistently and just if we are to literally put together every food that I've eaten over my lifetime popcorn excluding water what's the beverage that you've Lemonade. had the most of that's easy dang it mine's gatorade probably by a long shot then why'd you say dang it well I, di I didn't think that i was gonna have such a quick answer but here i am <laughs> i was gonna I, as a kid drank a lot of sprite mm -hmm. big sprite guy my my mom was like can't have coke because caffeine but sprite okay but isn't sprite caffeine free yeah bro that's what i just said well, you made it sound like of like you can't have Coke because, because of I have caffeine. caffeine. Yeah. But then you can have Sprite. And the way that you posed it made it sound like. No, you're just backtracking to realizing that no, I said it right. she was silly because they both have caffeine. Well, I just think, I mean, they both are filled with sugar. I okay. Know. I can see that point yeah. of it. Okay. Like the 40 milligrams of caffeine at 14 years old is not really going to do a whole lot for me. Okay. I don't know if she was still commanding what I drank at 14, but I assume <laughs> I was still under her roof, you know? She's still cracking the whip because she's All so right. mean and okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is my most favorite podcast. This um, this physique development podcast, not just this specific episode. So if it is your most favorite podcast, then make sure you leave us a review, share it with a friend who you think would really enjoy this or learn from it, and we'll catch you in the next episode.